All right, uh, well, you are in here uh, to learn more about using Log4j2 in web applications. Um, I see some of you stayed over from the previous session where Matt talked about, uh, introduced you to Log4j2 in general. Um, uh, if you thought you were in here for a different class, I'm sorry, you're in the wrong room, but don't leave because this is probably better than whatever it was you were going to go to anyway. Um, all right, so Log4j2 and web applications, it's not quite as simple as just using Log4j2 in your standard, say, console application. Um, and it's, it's not just a matter of we've tried to make it complicated or anything like that. It's just a matter of there are a lot of things you have to think about in a web application that you don't normally have to think about in like a desktop or console application. For example, uh, you don't have to think about the fact that there are numerous uh, uh, web applications running simultaneously, potentially, that could um, conflict with your logging. So we are going to discuss all those things today, um, and um, hopefully you will learn something. Um, I did include the link to the uh, uh, web application logging manual page um, for Log4j2. I highly encourage that, in addition to you know referring to these slides at a later date, you go to this URL and read everything on it and you know it's going to be very helpful to you if you are um, uh, working in uh, web applications. So just a quick introduction, um, I am Nick Williams. Um, I am a software engineer at UL Workplace Health and Safety. Um, many of you probably recognize the name UL. Um, it's probably on the back of most of the electronics in your home. Um, UL primarily does product certification. Um, it, which is really cool because we get to blow things up and burn things down. Um, but that is not what I do. I'm in a different business unit that deals with occupational um, uh, health and safety. Uh, so training programs and tracking uh, wellness and company clinics and things like that. Um, I'm a committer and a member of the PMC for Apache Logging. Um, you know, many of you already heard from my colleague over here, a committer uh, also for, uh, for Apache Logging, uh, Matt Sicker. Um, I'm a committer at FasterXML for the Jackson Mapper Data Type JSR310 module. Um, so JSR310 is the um, uh, the new Java 8 date and time API, and the Jackson Mapper. Uh, um, many of you may be familiar with that project. Um, has support uh, for the J Java 8 date and time types through this um, data type module. Um, I'm also the author of Professional Java for Web Applications. Um, which I am signing and selling um, in the Confluence Fourier uh, throughout the week. So if you're interested in learning more about the latest in web application development with Java 8, Java E7, and Spring 4, um, come by and flip through the book and you know, ask any questions you may have. Um, and then you can find me on GitHub and Twitter uh, at Beamer Boulevard and at Java underscore Nick. All right, so why is web app logging different? Well, multi-threading is crucial to web application operation. Um, you know, you could have hundreds or even thousands of simultaneous requests being handled by your web application, and all of those are going to be handled in individual threads in the normal case. So there are obviously exceptions to that. Um, web applications handle thousands of simultaneous users. Web containers can host multiple web applications simultaneously. Web containers often provide their own logging facilities. Uh, Mark Thomas, uh, which, who's a developer with Tomcat, was in here in the last session and was talking about how um, you know, the, the logging facilities that Tomcat uh, supplies are kind of a nightmare for them, and, and they may even try to get Log4j2 integrated into Tomcat. Um, I, I will definitely be following up with him on that. Um, and then logging initialization and shutdown is more complex. Uh, we were just talking uh, a few minutes ago about a regression bug that has reared its head in Log4j2 where in web applications a shutdown thread is being registered, but that shouldn't happen, and so as a result there's a memory leak. So all these things are, are things that make web application logging different from normal desktop or console application logging. And we have tried to address all of these and make them as easy to deal with as possible so that in many cases you don't even have to think about them. Um, so like I was saying, Log4j2 and Java EE should be just easy. Um, there is a, uh, if you're using Java EE 5, which is servlet 2.5, um, there is a filter and a listener that you need to register that takes care of, of the most important tasks for you. 
Um, if you're using Java EE6 or EE7, which is servlet 3.0 and 3.1, um, Log4j automatically registers that filter in Listener for you programmatically, so you don't have to add those to your deployment descriptor. Um, you can uh, customize the logging configuration using uh, 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 servlet context parameters, which we'll go over in a little bit. Um, you can create a filter to fish tag requests. Fish tagging is a very useful technique, which we will explore in detail. Um, you have to be very careful when dealing with asynchronous request handling, and we're going to go over that um, later in the, in the session. And um, we are, there are facilities for logging in, in Java server pages with a JSP tag library as opposed to having to just write Java. Um, so we'll take a minute at, uh, take a look for just a minute at Java E5 configuration. Um, it's important to note that Log4j2 does not support Java E4 or Servlet 2.4 and older web applications. So if you're running on Tomcat 5.5, or if you're running in Tomcat 6 or 7, but you've got your, your web application version set to 2.4, Log4j is not going to work properly. You will see errors. You will see abstract method errors. Um, you will see memory leak errors. So if you're on Servlet 2.4, which is very, very old, stop, upgrade, start using something newer. Um, what makes a web application Java EE5 servlet 2.5? Well, okay, so if you're running on, if you're running on a, a servlet 2.5 um, uh, server like Tomcat 6, all right, then you're going to be limited to servlet 2.5. Um, you can't run servlet 3.0 on a, on a, on a 2.5 uh, uh, application server. But if, say, you're on Tomcat 7, which is a servlet 3.0 application server, your application may still be servlet 2.5 if in the uh, web.xml uh, file, and, and we'll take a look at that real quick, um, if in the web.xml file your version is set to 2.5 there, it's still a version 2.5 application. It doesn't matter if you're running in Tomcat 7 or Tomcat 8 or Tomcat 12. It's a 2.5 application. Um, so as part of the Java E configuration, you have to add um, a, a, um, a listener in your web.xml file, the log4j servlet context listener. The full package name can be found on that manual uh, that I showed you the link to earlier. Um, you don't have to do anything special with that listener, you just need to add it to your web.xml file. Um, and then you need to register the log4j servlet filter and you need to map it to every URL in your application that could possibly log. What I wouldn't do is I wouldn't recommend, you know, I wouldn't recommend setting it up so that GIFs and CSS files and JPEGs and JavaScript files are all filtered by that filter because then you're just going to add overhead to serving those <coughs> static resources. But any URLs that could execute Java code that could possibly lead to logging statements occurring need to be filtered by that Log4j2 servlet filter. Now again, all of this is in Java E5. If you're in Java E6 or 7, it just works. Uh, you don't really have to do anything. Um, there is a caveat to that in that there is a, um, a bug or a feature that <laughs> in uh, Tomcat 7.0.4, 7.0.37, I'd, I'd have to look on the, but there's a, there was a bug in an earlier version of Tomcat 7 where it was, it was intentionally excluding all log4j files for, from scanning them for um, the um, servlet container initializer. And that was just based on an older version of log4j1 where the Tomcat developers knew that log4j1 didn't contain anything worth scanning for and so they just always excluded the log4j files. Um, so as of Tomcat 7, I, I think it's 3.7, as of, as of Tomcat 7.0.3.7, they have removed that restriction and, and it does scan Log4j files. Um, so the Log4j servlet container initializer is, is it's an implementation of the servlet container initializer that was added in servlet 3.0. Um, basically what that is, is it, it is a um, interfaces that implement, or classes that implement that interface get initialized earlier in the life cycle than even servlet listeners do. Um, so basically, the moment your application starts up, 
one of the first things that's going to happen is the, the container is going to find all servlet container initializers in your application. And it's going to call the startup method of those servlet container initializers. And that's going to happen before any of your listeners are invoked, before you, any of your filter init methods are invoked, before any of your servlet init methods are invoked, before any of that happens, all the servlet container initializers will get invoked. And so Log4j provides the Log4j servlet container initializer that adds the listener for you, that adds the filter for you, that makes sure that um, initialization and shutdown happen properly in the correct places of your application lifecycle. Now, if for some reason you need to disable just works, which I wouldn't recommend, but, but there are rare circumstances, maybe you need to just really customize something that Log4j is doing and it just doesn't work well with just works. You can add the um, servlet context uh, init parameter is log4j auto initialize disabled and set the value to true. Um, if you add that, then the log4j servlet container initializer will just do nothing. Remember, you're going to have to have a listener and a filter that set up log4j just like you did over here if you disable um, auto initialization. Um, so now, um, whether you're using a Servlet 2.5 application or a Servlet 3.0 or 3.1 application, um, there are um, some important um, uh, context parameters that you should know about. Uh, the first is um, the Log4j context name. All right, so what that does is it, it tells Log4j what the name of your, uh, of your logging context should be. Now, if you don't specify that, the default is for it to be the deployed name of your web application, which for most people is perfectly sufficient. In most cases, that's all they need. They don't need to customize that. But if you want to, for some reason, change the name of your logging context, you, um, uh, you use that uh, context init parameter right there. Um, if you want to uh, change the location of the configuration file, uh, just like Log4j1, Log4j2 by default looks for a specifically named configuration file on the class path. If you don't want it to look there, if you want to, example, hard code in a path, you know, d colon slash configuration slash Log4j dot XML, um, you would add the Log4j configuration context parameter into your web.xml file and um, set it to the value of the path to your configuration file. You can use environmental variable um, uh, substitution in there, and so it will get current environmental variables and um, um, you know, help you expand your file name that way. Um, and then there's the JNDI context selector, and I think I, <laughs> I think I may have made a little error on my slide there, so we're just going to go over here and look at the manual. Um, Okay, so um, one of the things we talked about in the previous session, just um, introducing Log4j, is this, this idea that you can, you can create a Log4j configuration and save it to your JNDI. Um, you know, uh, I don't know the exact details of how you would do that in Tomcat or, or Glassfish or whatever, but you can basically create a Log4j configuration that is saved to your global JNDI context. Um, and then what you can do is you can actually tell Log4j that it should find the um, uh, it should find the Log4j configuration not in a file but in JNDI, and that way you can have multiple applications share the same logging configuration if that's what you want to do. Um, so in order to enable that, you would add the is Log4j context selector, selector named context parameter and set it to true. Um, and then you would use the log4j context name um, um, and log4j configuration to um, uh, point that information. And again, that's going to depend on exactly what your, what your global JNDI configuration is. Um, that is not a common thing to do. It is something that some people do. Um, but in the interest of time, we're not going to go into the details of JNTI, JNDI configuration. Um, 
so now we're going to look at is fish tagging, and, and we're going to get to the exciting part of the presentation where we're actually going to write some code and run it and see what happens. Um, so what is a fish tag? Well, think about, um, think about all the components in your web application. You might have your, your servlet. You know, all web applications have a servlet of some type. It's, even if it's a JSP, it ultimately becomes a servlet. Um, if you're running Spring Framework, more than likely what you have is a controller. Um, still, Spring Framework has a servlet that handles requests to your controllers. Um, you may have uh, services and repositories. You may have other code that you don't control, like Spring Framework, like Hibernate or Eclipse Link, like Spring Data or Spring Security, all these different components that you may have running in your application. Now think about what happens when a user makes a request. When a user makes a request to your application, all these different components handle that request in some way. You know, if, a, if, if you retrieve an entity from the database, that's going to go through Spring Data and, and your JPA provider, um, or, or Spring Data and your Mongo uh, or uh, um, NoSQL driver or whatever that is. Um, if, uh, if the user is logging in, that's going to go through Spring uh, Security or whatever security uh, 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 framework you're using for your application. You see all of these, all of these components logging in your log file, and you wonder, well, how do I know what has to do with what? You know, if you're locally developing on your computer, you know, you're the only person using your application, it's easy to do a request and see what appears in the log file. But that's not even where logging is most useful. Where logging is most useful is on a production system where you have thousands of simultaneous users and you're trying to troubleshoot a problem that's going on. Sometimes a problem you can't even root duplicate locally. So how do you know which logging, uh, logging entries belong to a single request? This is where fish tagging comes in. At the beginning of the request, you generate a unique ID for that request and you assign it to the thread context, the Log4j thread context. Then what happens is, you, in your Log4j configuration, say you're using just a simple file appender with, with a layout, with a pattern layout, right? In your pattern, you put, that, you put that fish tag in the pattern. So what happens now is, when a, every, everything that gets logged as a result of that request, when it appears in that file, it has that fish tag. So if you've got thousands of requests going on at once, you're going to see all kinds of different fish tags. If you're using something like MongoDB or you know, MySQL or, or any other kind of logging, aggregating system other than a file that lets you really easily search through, you can just find all of the requests that belong to a specific fish tag. And, or all, sorry, all the log entries that belong to a, a, a specific fish tag. And then you know that this is everything that happened for this one request, even though there are all these other requests going on. So let's take a, a look at how you would do that. And my, um, my resolution has changed here, so I've got to kind of reconfigure here for just a minute. Um, so what we have here, we just have a, a very um, simple app application. Um, and just, you know, completely forget about the async servlet thing. We're, we're going to go over that in just a minute. Uh, but we, we have a standard servlet. It has a logger. Uh, received request is standard servlet routing to JSP. And then it gets the request dispatcher and sends us over to this JSP. And it outputs this response from, was sent from a standard servlet. Very, very mundane. That's beside the point. So what we want to do is we want to fish tag requests so that we can identify which logging events go with each request. So the first step to that is to create our fish tagging filter. Now what I have here is just a, uh, it, it, it's, a it's an empty filter, filter basically. It doesn't do anything at all right now other than continue the filter chain. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to create a request ID. Sorry, I'm still transitioning out of .NET because I've recently moved to that at work. <laughs> may not be the best way, it may not be how you want to generate IDs, but it's the simplest way to demonstrate here.
All right, so what we've done here is we've assigned a fish tag to this request, okay? And the important thing is after all request processing is done, we remove that ID, all right? That way it doesn't pollute other requests or, you know, um, if, if you have uh, background tasks that run outside of the scope of requests, that fish tag won't be associated with them or anything like that. Now, as you can imagine, because we've done this in a filter, it's important that this filter be the very first filter that executes in your application, um, other than the log4j filter that we talked about earlier, which sets up logging for the request. Um, the reason for this being, if you have another filter that runs between the log4j filter and this fish tagging filter, that filter, say it's the spring security filter, um, it's going to execute stuff that could result in logging, and that logging stuff won't have the fish tags. You want to make this as early as possible in the filter chain. So then what you're going to do is you're going to go over here to your log4j configuration, and you're going to left over there. Um, so this this percent x that is the standard um, um, pattern token for the thread context in the the pattern layout in log4j, and then you just tell it which pattern we're putting there, which in this case is the fish tag. Um, so now let's build. You notice that wasn't hard at all. We wrote three lines of Java in our filter, and then we just added this fish tag to our pattern layout, and that's it. Okay, so we've sent a request to our application. We got a response back. Now we're going to go back and look at the log. Okay, you'll notice, all right, so we have this, this log statement from our filter that says starting fish tagging filter. That, that was in the init method in the filter, right? It doesn't have a fish tag because it wasn't part of a request. That happened during application startup. But then here we have this line entry right here that has this fish tag in it, all right? Receive requests and standard server routing to JSP. Now we only have one log entry. That's not very useful, right? Well, let, let's put in a few more log entries and, and you know, get an idea of exactly what that means. And maybe we'll uh, put in a log entry here, too. And we'll just uh, reload those classes. Clear our log out here. Reload that. Go back to our log. Text Wrangler messed up my. Yeah, I think Text Wrangler, I'm going to restart the application. When I saved it in Text Wrangler, I think that took away Log4J's handle. Okay, now let's go back. Okay, now, let's see if we can, all right, so you notice we have, ah, and we learned something about the servlet API in, in the, 
in the interim. All right, so we have this added fish tag to request, received, request, and let's do another request because we have several going on here at once. Okay. Added fish tag to request, received request in standard servlet routing to JSP. That is interesting that we're getting this again. Uh, you know what I bet's happening? Um, Chrome is requesting to favicon. When I refresh, it's probably requesting to favicon, and that's hitting the filter. Um, but you'll notice that the last one we put in, the request dispatch successfully doesn't have a fish tag. So basically what that means is, by the time it got to that log statement, the servlet had finished sending the JSP back to the um, back to the user and it had ended the, uh, the filter chain. And so the fish tag had been removed by that point. So as you can see, fish tagging can be very useful. Obviously, we didn't demonstrate it in very many components, but if you imagine if you had Spring Security and Spring Framework and Hibernate and all these things working together to serve a request, you could have, especially if you're trying to troubleshoot a problem and you turned on a fine level of detail in your logging, you could have hundreds or thousands of, of log entries for that one request, and it could be hard to sort them out. But with fish tagging, you can find all the requests, all the entries that are related to a single request because they have that same fish tag with each entry. Now let's talk about asynchronous requests. Um, who in here has worked with the asynchronous API in Servlet 3.0 and above? Anybody? Okay, admittedly, I haven't actually used it in practice. I've used it in example and in testing out components of Log4j, but in practice, I haven't found a use for it. Um, but there exists in Servlet 3.0 this and, and higher, of course, this notion of um, receiving a request and then basically saving it to respond to later, all right? And there could be any, any number of reasons. Maybe the request is kicking off some kind of log running process. The user knows it's going to take a while for the request to come back, and you want to free up that thread to go handle another request somewhere. And then once that long running process is complete, then you want to send the response back. That is one of the common use cases of asynchronous requests. Okay, so let, let's, let's look at how that works just in an, in an asynchronous servlet. I'm also going to uh, There we go. Okay. Okay, so here we have our, um, what we call our async servlet. It isn't doing anything right now. So what we're going to do is we're going to say request dot get async context. Okay, so in this case, we are getting the asynchronous context for this request, all right? That does not mean that we are doing anything asynchronous yet. We are getting an API that allows us to handle the request asynchronously. Now, there are lots of different things that you can do with the async context, and it's outside of the scope of this presentation to show you what all those are. So I'm just going to do the very, very simplest um, okay, so I'm going to start the async context. All right, now what this means is I am, um, um, I am telling the application server that I'm going to handle this request asynchronously. And here's a runnable that is going to handle this request asynchronously. 
And that runnable is probably going to do something like sleep for a while and then respond to the request. Meanwhile, hey, t hey application server, this thread that you're consuming for this request, go on and, and give it to another request. And then you can you know, bring it back to me when I'm ready to actually send a response to the user. So what we're going to do here is we're going to, we're just going to duplicate that. So we're going to sleep for five seconds. <coughs> um, and then we're going to just send a random response back to the to the user. Sorry, my bad response. My, it's my C sharp, my C sharp coming out. Okay, so we're going to sleep for five seconds, and then we're going to send a response back asynchronously. Um, but what we're going to do here is we're going to also add a logging statement. Now our fish tags are going to help us out here to demonstrate a key problem. Build this, fire it up. Oops. It would appear that I committed a fatal error. How could that be null? Ah, that's why. There we go. We have to tell the servlet container that we're supporting asynchronous activity in this. Servlet. All right, now let's try that again. That shouldn't happen. That's why. Yeah. See, this demonstrates how often I don't use <laughs> asynchronous servlets. Okay, the context is not null anymore. Excellent. All right. 
So we notice we're spinning here. It's still waiting for a response. Although it should not have waited, oh, should not have waited that long. Oh, well, it did eventually respond. Okay, so what we've done here now is we've, we've responded to a request asynchronously using the async context tools in the server API. But let's take a look at the log. All right, you'll notice we have our fish tag, added fish tag to request, and before asynchronous context. But you notice there's no fish tag in our log statement in asynchronous context. All right. Well, that's one of the downsides of using asynchronous requests. Once this method returns, the filter chain completes or once this message dispatches a request to a JSP, the filter chain completes, all right? So all this code right here that's executing, it's not executing within the filter chain. It's executing outside the filter chain. In fact, it's executing in a different thread entirely. And so as a result, there's no fish tag. But what's really important to understand is as a result, log4j has not set up everything that it needs to set up. If you're using something special like the, uh, like the JNDI logging context, right? Looking that up is an expensive um, activity. One of the things the log4j filter does, the one that automatically is getting registered in that server container initializer, is it caches that logging context that it looked up from the JNDI. And every request that comes through it just sets the logging context on the thread to the one that it cached so that it doesn't have to look it up in JNDI every request. But what's happened here, if say we were using the JNDI logging context instead of just the file on the class path, is, is when, this, when this executed right here, it would have to look up that logging context from JNDI again because it wouldn't be able to find it. It wouldn't be, it wouldn't be running through the, the, the filter and so it wouldn't have been set automatically. So, it's important that the log4j filter intercept things that you do. All right, so what can we do about that? Well, instead of response.getwriter.append, let's dispatch the request somewhere. You could dispatch it to another servlet or you could dispatch it to a JSP. Doesn't matter, we're gonna dispatch the request using the async context. if I'm remembering how to do this right. I think I'm remembering how to do this right. All right, so now we're going to, we're telling the async context, instead of, instead of getting the output stream and just writing to it, we're telling the async context to dispatch the request to a JSP. Okay, once again, it's gonna wait a little while before it responds. Okay, now, this time we got a response back from the JSP. So let's go look at our, uh, okay, so what we have here, we have our fish tag, and we have our, we have our fish tag for added fish tag to request, and we have our fish tag for before asynchronous context. And then we have the in asynchronous context, which remembers you know, none of the code that's running in there has access to the fish tag because it's outside the filter chain, so there's no fish tag on that. But then we have another added fish tag to request. What has happened here is we take a look at, whoa, IntelliJ, sometimes. yeah, it does that sometimes. All right, so we told IntelliJ that this filter applies to all the different dispatches, the async dispatch, error, forward, include, request. So what that means is the filter is going to execute um, um, again when you call context.dispatch. 
Now, importantly, we have done the same thing with the Log4j filter. It covers all requests. So as long as you're using, as long as you're not using asynchronous requests or you're continuing your asynchronous quest using a dispatch, Log4j will be set up properly. And that, that's the key there. You need to always use dispatch. If you're using asynchronous requests, you need to always use dispatch so that Log4j can be properly set up for the request. <clears throat> All right. So what's next? OK, using the JSP tag library. Now, disclaimer here, it's not always the best idea to log in JSPs. In fact, if you're doing something in a JSP that requires logging, you're probably doing it wrong. You probably need to move that into controller code or whatever. Your JSPs are supposed to be for presentation, and there really shouldn't be much need for logging. But let's say you really just have a legitimate need for logging. What do you do? Well, you could just use the log manager to get a logger and you know, print out, you know, you just write Java in your JSP and print out log statements. But a lot of people don't like to use Java in the JSP. In fact, maybe you've given your UI developers complete control over your JSP and they don't even know Java, but they know JSP tags. So the JSP tag library makes this really easy. Mm. We're gonna go over to this guy. All right, so we're adding the log4j tag library to our JSP. And now look, we've got catching, log, debug, dump, entry, error, exit, fatal, if enabled, info, set logger, warn, and trace. So we've got all the things we'd normally have with a logger object in Java. For the most part, we can just do them with this logger tag. Um, so, or with this logger tag library. So we're just gonna, we're just gonna do an info. All right, um, message in standard uh, JSP. And we're gonna go over to our async guy over here. And we're gonna do the same thing. In async JSP. We're going to restart our, yeah. and clear this out too, so we're not getting confused by that. Okay, so let's fire this up. Go over here. We'll just go back to our standard one for now. Okay, response sent from standard servlet. So it went to our JSP. Now let's go look at our log. Well, now wait a minute, what happened? So we had added fish tag to request, receive requests in standard servlet routing to JSP. Well, we didn't, we didn't have anything output from the JSP. Well, all right. By default, it's going to just create a new logger for the JSP, and that logger is going to be named after the name of the JSP servlet. Well, in our configuration, all we have is this net.nicholaswilliams.java. Everything else is worn. So our, uh, our JSPs are going to start with org.apache because they're Tomcat. Let's do this again. OK. 
Okay, now let's look at our log. Well, now what on earth? So we've got the added fish tag to request, received request in standard servlet routing JSP, added fish tag to request, and then in standard JSP. So we logged from the JSP, but, but we've, we've got a different fish tag. Does anybody know why we have a different fish tag? The dispatch. The dispatch, exactly. All right, so when we dispatched, it went through the filter again. Now that's okay. We just got to account for it in our filter. So now what we're going to do here We're only going to add a fish tag if there's not already a fish tag. And we're only going to remove the fish tag if we added the fish tag in the same invocation. So we'll stick this filter back out there. Reload one more time. Go look at our log. Now, all four of our requests have the same fish tag. Added fish tag to request. See request standard server right in JSP. Probably should have moved that log entry because it didn't actually change the fish tags you notice. And then in standard JSP. So that is logging in JSPs and, and we also got a, a better look at how we have to be careful about how we write our filters and use our dispatches. Okay, so Cutting it kind of close here, and I apologize for how short of a question period we're going to have. Um, but, uh, you know, I open the floor for any questions you may have about what we covered today. As a reminder, I'll be signing and selling copies of my book in the Confluence Fourier. Um, those times are right. Ignore them. Um, <laughs> um, but, no, I, it will be... Um, no, I guess those times are right. Yeah, yeah, those times are right. Yeah, uh, today, 1220 to 230 and 3.45 to 6.30, and tomorrow 10 to 1.15, and 2.15 to 3.15. So if you're interested in just flipping through my book, come on by. But please, questions, anybody? I do. Oh, go ahead. What's the difference between thread context and thread context map? Okay, so, well, okay, so thread, thread context has two things in it. It has a map and it has a, a stack, all right? And you can use either of them. Um, the, the map is, is just what it sounds like. It's key to value, all right? So you, you add a key and you add its value, and then you can retrieve that value by key, and then you can remove that value by key or whatever you want to do. Um, the stack in thread context is, again, just like it sounds, it's a stack. But you can't, like, unlike a map, you can't add things and look things up by key. You just pop things onto the stack and you push things off of the stack. To be honest, I've never found a use for the stack in the thread context. That doesn't mean there isn't one, and, and there are lots of different ways people write applications and use log4j, and, and somebody out there may have a use for the stack and thread context, but I always use the map. And that's available just through thread context? Yeah, you can use them both through, you can thread context.push will push something onto the stack, um, thread context.put will put something on the map. So. Thread context map and thread context stack are the two things you kind of delegate to us there? Right. Oh, okay. Right. I'm sorry, I can't hear you. Hold on a second. Okay, okay. Well, uh, they're, they're the same thing. That I, just different, different terms for the same thing. Um, the NDC is that you're used, in, in Log4j1, you're used to something called the NDC. In Log4j2, it's called the thread context. They're, they're the same thing. Um, and the fish tag that I was adding is just like adding an ID to the NDC and using that. It's, it's the same thing, yes. can't. You, you, you know, no. You'll, what you'll end up doing is you'll, you'll find, um, um, you'll open up the log file and you'll, you'll find characters misplaced and, and you, you don't want to do that. Um, if you've got multiple applications in the same container running at the same time, then, 
well, I'm, I'm just giving an example. If you, if you have multiple applications in the same container running in the same JVM, they can share a file if you have uh, log4j on your application server class path instead of your, your application class path, and you set up your configuration in the JNDI global context. But if they're in different application servers, different JVMs entirely, you cannot write to the same file. You need to you know, use something like uh, what he was talking about in the previous session, um, you know, uh, NoSQL database or a relational database or Flume or TCP UDP or, or something else other than a file if you want them to go to the same place. Oh, no, it absolutely does. Yes, yeah, you can trigger a reload of the configuration. And importantly, um, one of the, the great new features about Log4j over, say, you know, log back, for example, if you change the configuration and reload it at runtime, you won't lose logging events. It, 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 but the application actually does that, or the Log4j takes care of that. The setting you can change to have it auto check if a file changed. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. There, you, you can tell it to auto-check the file, and if the configuration file changes, it'll automatically reload the configuration. So does it require any extra configurations, or it works out of the box? It works out of the box. You can also reconfigure it through JMS. If it's been moved. Yeah, yeah. So if, you, so if you connect to the application server or whatever the JVM is via JMX, you can, there's a bean in there that shows you um, what's going on in Log4j, and you can edit the configuration at runtime and, and reload it. Anybody else? I like that fish tagging thing. Fish tagging is very useful. Well, and, and about fish tagging, um, one thing I forgot to say is, um, you know, I showed this in a single, a single layer, all right? But maybe you've got a multi-tiered application, and you've got different servers that are all involved in handling a request. So maybe one server handles part of a request, and then it it does like a, a web service request to another server, and that server hand, uh, handles part of the request. What you can do is you can set up something where the servers can hand off the fish tag to each other. All right? So the first server that receives the request creates a fish tag and assigns it. But then when it sends the request to another server, it sends the fish tag along with it. So the other request uses the same fish tag. All right? Then your logging events, maybe you include the server name in the, in the pattern layout, the host name, or the application name, or whatever, all right? And all your logging events across multiple servers will have the same fish tag. And you can tell what server it came from. So fish tags are very, very powerful. All right, I think technically we're out of time. I'm, if you want to ask questions, I can keep answering questions, but um, I, technically we have to stop now, so. <laughs>